to power that the federal government can never have. He doesn't say why the federal government can't can't um, cannot uh, issue in a uniform way and upon 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 certifying our creditworthiness and enforce in a credible way thereafter our debts which of course are enforced by the government today uh not necessarily directly by the federal government but as we all know when we're thrown out of our homes in our businesses who does this the sheriff comes the government enforces the debts and the properties returned to the bank to whom it should never, ever, 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 ever belong. And we are dispossessed of our own production. So it's done by government, but it's done on behalf of the very private banks that this bastard, Hayek, is proposing would solve our problems, which problems he's blaming on the federal government, though the banking system is actually this very banking system that he's advocating. That's how preposterous is it, this is. Just go to von Mises, uh, dot org and search for Frederick Hayek, just Hayek, H-A-Y-E-K, and free market monetary system, which is what Ron Paul was advocating in the GOP debate the other night. Free market monetary system. One of the most preposterous papers you could ever read. So flawed and yet so accepted and advocated by Austrians despite its blatant flaws. What it thinks is the truth is the opposite of the truth and what it's saying is the truth is the opposite of the truth all the way through the damn paper. And it doesn't say in a word of actually how, an accountable word, how that could possibly save us. And of course it couldn't because the very banking system that he's decrying is the cause of the problems, not the solution. And that's what an Austrian economist is. They're even worse than that. You know, they, 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 they object to any mathematics whatsoever. But Griffin even attempts to use some mathematics in this book here. And he goes right back to the same thing where he tries to prove um, that you know, we can wax the floors at the bank and we don't have to borrow the money back that we pay out of circulation back into circulation. And he claims now to be disproving my by my proposition of of inherent failure under this implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation. He claims to disprove it now because it's the advocates of this, what he calls a childish idea. The advocates of the childish idea claim this is the only way that money could get back into circulation. Show us that claim, Griffin. When I was 16, I evaluated, you know, well, yeah, you could work for the bank, but how many people could work for the bank? And how much would they have to do that? And it would have to amount to all the principal and interest. But how could that be rendered to them but in money? Because if we give up the property equal to the principal, which is how we would get the principal back into circulation, the banking system would be the owner of everything. And the interest doesn't even exist in circulation, you see. So there are there's actually multiple levels of how it's mathematically impossible to do that. What's more, all we have to do is look around us and see, well, how many of us, how much of our work and our production is actually consumed by the banking system? Very little. True, they take proprietorship of vast, vast things. But that isn't even a drop in the bucket itself in terms of negating this perpetual escalation of artificial indebtedness. So so Griffin's offense or, or, or defense and attempt to make his disproof stick is that now the advocates of this childish idea claim this is the only way, which isn't even close to true. You know, and, and Griffin, you can call me any day and I'll discuss that with you as a gentleman, you know, but this makes me sick. You know, this make this disgusts me more than I can tell anyone. You know, it, it it would be unfit to hear what I think about this when I'm looking through, peering through glass at empty storefronts and finding mattresses on the floor. You know, the monetary power of its politicians is the next phrase after the comma. The monetary power of its pro, pro, 
politicians. Well, it shouldn't be politicians. It should be officers of government. More rightfully, it should be representatives, which is a word that I would certainly use because it emphasizes the obligation of governments in every republic of the world. We are not democracies, ladies and gentlemen. You hear the word all the time. <laughs> That's just some of the worst you can hear from any pretended authority that, you know, democracy is spreading across the world. We are republics, and it's a different thing. Democracy was largely considered to be mob rule, and indeed it would be, uh, it, at least in any state that the world has existed in to now. We can eventually grow beyond that, but, you know, uh, so long as we don't really realize what is meritable argument, you know, we're hopeless even to discuss things with each other. People get pissed off. People don't even realize they just heard the proof of the truth, and they just go on sit and, and go right back to saying something different is the truth, which was just disproven, and we don't even know any better. You know, this is this is the world today. It isn't just America where we have become probably the greatest fools in our history. It's the world. It's the world. It's people in Greece who don't think their economy can be saved. When the answer is right here, right now, and they could do it tomorrow if they were so disposed to hold their representatives accountable. But Griffin says they're politicians, which indeed they are. But a politician isn't somebody who's necessarily even in office, and that's the first thing about the word that struck me. So why would anyone say it's a politician? You know, that could be a guy who's who's campaigned for office for for forty years and never got a vote yet. You know, um, but anyway, he says the monetary power of its politicians must be limited solely to the maintenance of honest weights and measures. Whoa, 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 wait. What did that all say there then? The monetary power must be limited to the maintenance of honest weights and measures. Monetary power? I, I understand that Griffin wants to limit money to gold before I even get to the end of the sentence. But monetary power isn't doesn't have anything to do with weights and measures and it only has something to do with honest weights and measures if indeed it is honest weights and measures if whatever the standard is is adhered to and Griffin is not advocating that nor are the Austrians, nor are the Ron Paul supporters, or the gold bugs who, you know, fall in behind Ron Paul. What they really want is a revision of the standard by which all the people that hold a tiny bit of gold will make out like, like what they consider bandits. And yet, from that minimal circulation, we, we, we remain responsible to, 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 to pay our debts out of circulation in gold. Or certificates for gold now, my God! <laughs> when when all the gold represents still is 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 our our obfuscated promissory obligation, the obfuscation of which remains terminal. Does the fact that we give gold to the bank for our debts does that erase the fact that we've got to borrow the interest and principal back into circulation? No, so. This can't possibly save us. And he says that this power has to be limited solely to the maintenance of honest weights and measures of precious metals. Well, now we have to, now that we've reached the end of the sentence by adding the three last words of precious metals, we have to reevaluate what this word maintenance means then. What does he mean maintain? honest weights and measures of precious metals. 
No, 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 no. You would establish them unless you are going to manipulate the value of money or property. And who wants that? If the value of property is manipulated upward, the holders of money are offended. They will not be able to meet their obligations or live to the standards they were before. If the opposite is raised, the opposite are offended in, in the like way. Never, 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 never do we want to manipulate the value of currency. And so to maintain honest weights and measures is a preposterous lie that it could serve us. It, in fact, gives government the power to impose a fence, which is the very power which is manifested in this obfuscation of the currency, which offense is just a bit more complex because the manipulation of the, of the cost or value of money or property is imposed by this twofold obfuscation in which the debt is falsified, the, 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 the promissory obligation is transformed into a falsified debt to the bank, which is not owed the money, which money instead should be paid and retired from circulation. And then this falsified debt to the bank is subjected to interest, which is imp what imposes this implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation, which is terminal. All the reborrowing of principal and interest ever escalates the sum of debt until we suffer a terminal sum of debt. So that's what's, that's what's terminal, but he's advocating this same, in fact, uh, unwarranted unrightful power of government and of course if we were to give this power let's just say it accomplished a just end justly we couldn't state just such a thing we would have to show what the means of accomplishing that would be and we would likewise have to restrict those means to just bounds not only is there not a word of that in this book here? Worse, he's actually advocating, if you read elsewhere, he's actually advocating that this purported vast value of gold vacillates according to whatever a free market, as he calls it, determines which, of course, free market is going to com be comprised of debts subject to interest by depriving us of our right to issue promissory obligations free of exploitation, which is the only way to finance all the prosperity we are, and to finance and to represent just reward for all of the pro prosperity we are capable of. So, I read this and I think this, you know, I mean, these are these are just my very first thoughts about the first sentence I read in this book as I opened it. It falls open on page 153 and I'm I'm struck like I was when I read the words, beware the hypocrites. I have to think then, well, what does this descend from? So I look over to the adjacent page and it says natural law number two. Oh, he's telling me this is a natural law? Well, if it's a natural law, why hasn't nature decided this in, in, in and of itself somehow? Or, or why isn't it evident what the gold, value of gold would be in nature? And, and, and if it is evident, and I say that it is, why would the value of gold be decided on some different principle as if it were rare when it might exist in less quantity than something like, uh, you know, bamboo fly fishing rods? Um, what is the principle? Natural law number two. But I see under that, I see this is on page 152. He has another word in all caps. It's lesson, and that's what 
the law is deduced from